MuseScore. Welcome to the MuseScore Cafe. So, uh, you know, uh, we continually uh, try new things and uh, experiment with uh, stuff. And I've got some new things that I want to be introducing here. And um, really excited by, uh, by what this will entail. And so let's first make sure that uh, you're all seeing and hearing me because last week there was who knows what going on that caused, uh, caused this not to happen. No music, seriously. Oh, yes, 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 that's me. That's, that's on me. That, sorry. Um, that's on me. Um, that is totally on me. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> one more try. Thanks for the, uh, the heads up on that. I forget. I need to make myself checklist. So, you hear me, right? You just weren't hearing the music, and now you are, is my assumption, my guess, my hope. So, uh, let me know. And, um, yeah, that was totally my fault. My fault. Um, okay. So, um, so yeah, the, uh, the thing that I want to be talking about is this new, um, new series of workshops that I'm going to be doing. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment. And, yes, uh, I, I definitely want to put together a checklist for myself uh, of everything. And the problem is, of course, that this... I run this differently than the music master class, and sometimes I forget which one that I'm doing, and I should just have separate checklists. So, absolutely, that's that's my assignment. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what's uh, what's actually going on here. So, um, what I'm going to do is uh, first thing I want to do is just. Mm, talk about well what it is that I'm <laughs> my big picture goal here and then I'll get into more specifics my big picture goal is to help people more so I've shared this a little bit uh, in uh, in my office hours and I may have mentioned it during music master class I'm not positive um, or at least I meant to but then of course master class last week was weird but um, you know I have been teaching at universities for a long time for like well you know relatively long time like 15 years and I've had like several different university teaching jobs, adjunct teaching jobs. Some of them were just for a year, some of them for multiple years. But the one I've had the longest is the one, the only one I still did at a local school here called Regis University. And I just put my notice in uh, a week or two ago and told them that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to continue teaching there. Not because I didn't enjoy teaching there, but the amount of time that it uh, took away from what I am doing here was starting to become uh, difficult. And I it's not that I didn't enjoy what I was doing there, but juggling is sometimes hard and all the context switching, the going back and forth. And really what I'm doing here, I feel like I can reach so many people and do so much good in the world. And uh, that's where I want to put my focus. And so I just decided I'm going to be uh, at least taking a break from university teaching, and we'll see uh, if that ever comes back um, for me. And so I want to be focusing on reaching, on being able to put all my efforts on helping all of you. And by all of you, I mean the people who are already here, as well as the people who maybe haven't joined us yet. And so uh, that is what I'm after here. I want to really be focusing on what I every, on what I can do to help people the most. And so when I did that poll a couple weeks ago, part of it was to get an idea of, well, of the people who are... Um, already uh, kind of on board in some way, either because you're already participating in the Music Masterclass or Cafe, or because you're on my mailing list, um, the newsletter, uh, to get a sense of what people are most valuing, and then build something around there, and then hopefully more people come join as well. So that is the goal, and the two winning things, as I uh, related, were ha things having to do with notating music and things having to do with ear training and also harmony, which to me are very related. So that's where I'm starting here. So uh, the two new ventures that I'm launching this week that you've been getting emails about, hopefully, are what I'm calling the Music Engraving Workshop and um, musicianship skills workshop. I got to get these names into my head, right? They're new. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is this word workshop. It's not an ideal word, but I don't know what is. Um, the idea is that these are courses in a way, but they're not 
structured like my other courses with a clearly defined start and finish and all. They're ongoing things that just <laughs> more information, ongoing learning. So continuing education, except that has other connotations. Um, but that's what we're talking about here. And so uh, we're talking about these ongoing things. And the name Workshop, Colleen, you, you probably recognize the, uh, the reference here. Uh, there's an organization here in Colorado called Colorado Jazz Workshop. And it's just an ongoing thing. It, workshop sometimes means like a one-time thing, right? Something that just lasts for a week or a weekend. That's not what I'm talking about. I am really talking about an ongoing thing. And, but a, a place where you all work together and uh, co-working space, but no, that means something different. It's just not really good words. So anyhow, this is what we're talking about, an ongoing weekly thing to work on music engraving and musicianship skills. So today I'm going to talk about music engraving, and I'm going to talk about what kinds of things we'll cover in the workshop, and we'll actually do some of it. Um, so uh, that's the deal. So let me make sure... I'm just going to flip back over and uh, see, because uh, every once in a while I just want to make sure that I'm not having problems and that um, I'm actually, oh, I meant to be logged in on my other machine here so I can be seeing. So that's actually what I meant to do. Okay, so um, there we go. Much better. So um, uh, let's talk about music engraving. And we're going to talk about it from the perspective of this score here, my actual MuseScore Cafe theme. Um, if you think about learning how to use MuseScore, and I talk a lot about how to use MuseScore, which button to press to do this, and which button to press to do this, and, and so forth, that all kind of assumes that um, uh, you know what you want, what this is, what you want to do. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about and what we're going to be working on in the music engraving workshop here is uh, how to know this. Like I can tell you, oh, if you want to enter these notes here, here's how to do it. But then there's all sorts of questions like, well, how did I know to spell this note as G flat instead of F sharp? I mean, this is my own composition. I had to decide that. That's a little bit of a music theory thing, but it's a little bit of a music engraving thing. And these are going to, there, there's blurry lines here. Um, so uh, for that matter, why is the exact same melody uh, notated as an F sharp over here? Um, and I can tell you the reason for that. That's just a little muse scoreism. It's because this score is in concert pitch mode. But if I turn off concert pitch mode so that we see it uh, as it would normally look, uh, with the written pitches, um, now we're going to see what musicians would actually see reading this, the music transposed for them. And those are the spellings that are going to make sense in their transposed keys. So these are all really practical considerations. What's the right spelling? Is it could it make sense to spell notes differently when you're in concert pitch versus when it's transposed? Why would that make sense? How would you decide? Hey, these are these are music engraving questions, right? Um, this question here, like if, if I play the score, that, you'll notice I notated it with this fall symbol here, right? Um, playback wise, I added a, an invisible gliss because that fall symbol doesn't play back. So knowing that in MuseScore, you might have to do it both ways and, you know, me showing you that that's how you do it. But knowing that that fall symbol exists, that the gliss symbol is not the proper symbol to use for this type of thing. That's a music engraving thing. So and this is a is a, you know, jazz chart, I guess. Um, it's it's maybe more of a pop funk kind of a thing, but it's got jazz elements. And that's obviously um, where some of my expertise is. And I want to talk about that expertise a little bit because I want to talk about where my experience comes from and where what I have to share and what I have to learn from those of you who have more experience and perhaps guests that I will bring on because I'm very aware that I am not like the sole source of <laughs> authority on on these matters. So I want to talk about a, a couple of things. So one of them is this. 
uh, if I, I'm going to look at my other screen here and see if, uh, see if I'm showing you what I think I'm showing you. Um, but uh, this is the real book. This is the most popular fake book in the world for jazz musicians. And it has a long and storied history. Well, not that long, but since like the late 70s is when it was being developed. The early 80s is when musicians first started getting a hold of it. And it was produced by some college students in, in Berklee School of Music uh, in Massachusetts. And uh, it was done completely illegally, all done by hand and all, and with uh, with complaints about errors here, bad choices there, but still it was well done in so many ways that it became a standard because there was nothing better at the time. And uh, back in the early, so that was in the 70s, early 80s, and it really kind of became in over the course of the next 10 years, the standard fake book that all jazz musicians use. And don't worry, I'm not just talking about jazz here. I'm just starting there because that's part of my uh, introduction to this world. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, and I'm going to just keep, uh, I, I, I'm loving that the questions are coming in the chat, and I totally don't mind just uh, interrupting my train of thought for that, and I'm going to remember where I left off. Um, the thing is, when you write a fall, it's really up to the musicians to decide how far that fall is. And that's typical. Sometimes you will write long fall or short fall. And also, these symbols here are editable. You can click this thing and drag it. So now it's there, and it's more obviously a longer fall, right? So you can indicate to musicians. And you have to realize that in this world that I'm talking about, kind of the jazz world, um, people are used to having that kind of leeway. I mean, it's a world of improvisation. Even though there's not room for improvisation in this particular piece, um, everything's fully notated, it's um, still the case that the kinds of musicians who would be playing this are used to taking those kinds of liberties. So, yeah, you notate something kind of vaguely and let them decide. Um, so... Uh, uh, edible, no, ed editable is definitely what I meant to say, um, yeah, but maybe I did. Um, so yeah, and that's the thing where then you hire different musicians, you get a different sound to it, and that's part of the charm of jazz, I guess, or all of this sort of jazz-related music. If you think about it, pop music, funk music, all these genres really came from jazz. Jazz was the original pop music as far as this all goes. So, um, uh, yeah, it's to be expected, you know, you hire musicians based on their own personal taste and what you think they're going to bring to it. And you hire the trumpet player who you think will play it the way you want. And then you trust his judgment. And then if you don't like what he plays, you tell him, hey, follow a little longer there. So that's my answer. So this idea that music in the jazz world has a lot of leeway, this gets back to the real book here. If you look at a typical chart here, um, I'm assuming that you can see this well enough. It's just, as jazz charts typically are, melody and chord symbols. That's all that there is, a melody and chord symbols. If there's lyrics and it's a fake book meant for singers, there'll be lyrics also. Um, so I'm going to undo those changes to not mess up anything about my score here. So uh, you're used to, as a pianist then, interpreting the chord symbols as you see fit, creating your own voicings for them, creating your own rhythms for them, etc. If you're a bass player, you create your own bass lines. So we're accustomed to having that kind of leeway in how we do things. And uh, that's part of the jazz world. It's obviously not as much a part of the classical world, right? So I am going to not talk about jazz exclusively, but again, this is my introduction to this world. So bear with me. So uh, this book became the standard, and uh, but not this book, by, me, by which I mean this actual physical piece of paper here. Uh, this book, uh, as you see, has like a barcode on the back and a um, uh, Hal Leonard uh, copyright message or not copyright message but catalog number and all so the deal is the original version was completely illegal just done by students photocopying it selling it i bought my original copy out of the back of someone's station wagon at this 
parking lot of the steak and egg kitchen in Tallahassee, Florida. And you basically and bought it with a check made out to cash. That is that is the story of the real book there. You basically buy it like you're buying drugs is essentially how that worked. Um, and at some point in the early uh, 2000s, the people at Hal Leonard, one of the biggest publishers in the world, said, um, uh, oh, yeah, you're right. I, I should totally do it. But the details aren't important, so don't worry about it, Dan. Details aren't, aren't important for that. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right that when I share things in general, I should do that. Um, but uh, so um, the, the people at Hal Leonard said, you know, this isn't cool. It's, it's, it's not good that, uh, um, th that this book is being circulated that has all these errors in it. It's not good that the composers aren't getting paid for it. And it's not good that we're not in for our cut of the action, right? So the people at Hal Leonard decided we're going to do our own version of the real book. And they did it in classic style of saying, you know what, the real book was just some people copying things off records and doing it without permission. We're just going to copy the original real book and do it ourselves and not ask for permission. So this cover is literally just exactly copied from the original illegal cover. And everything about the book, from the choice of tunes to the choice of how they choose, choose to lay things out, how many measures per line tunes were, all sorts of decisions were based on... Um, just basically copying what the original students did, but improving the things that needed improving. So this was the idea. And I had a friend who worked at a music store um, who uh, told me that, uh, oh, Hal Leonard is working on this because they got were, you know, they got advanced notice about this and he told me about it and I was like oh yeah that sounds really interesting um let me know when it comes out and the day it came out he called me up and I know some of you have heard this story but he called me up and said the books arrived uh we haven't put them on the shelves yet but you should come uh, come check it out so I came and bought like the very first copy uh I'm sure it was the very first copy sold in Denver and bought it and took it home and just played through the whole thing I mean, I didn't literally play every single song, but I looked at it page by page, compared it to the original, played through it, looked at where the differences were, and wrote up a really detailed review of it online. Just, uh, this was 2000. Yeah, so I guess it was World Wide Web, but I think I posted it on like a, a, a news group. I don't think it was even on a website, but uh, um, I posted it online and... It was so new that the people at Hal Leonard who worked on it, one of their main editors and the vice president of the company, who was a jazz a jazz musician, um, were like busy Googling themselves to see, you know, what are, what are people saying about, about about our book? And I was the first person to come out with anything. Uh, and it was like a very well researched, well thought out review. And it was positive review, but it was very detailed, not just this is good, this is bad, but really getting inside. Here's some choices they made. And it's really interesting. They chose to do it this way. And I can see why they did that. Here's the choice they made that, well, I probably would have done it differently. But, you know, it was a very just thoughtful review and in my typical long winded fashion. So, so they saw that and said, yeah, this guy knows what we're doing. He understands. Let's give him a call and get him to help with volume two. And so I then got hired uh, by Hal Leonard, um, again, like just like at Regis as an adjunct. You know, I wasn't an employee. I was a contract uh, person. But basically, I worked, uh, I was one of the main uh, editors then for Muse, for not Muse Score, for uh, Real Book Volume 2, Volume 3, Volume 4, and then a couple other specialty versions they did. The, the Blues Real Book, the Rock Real Book, the Berkeley Real Book. Um, which was sort of an ironic thing, special project done just for this, just for Berkeley uh, College of Music, School of Music, which is where the whole thing started. But, and then Hal Leonard ended up doing a special version for them. So I worked on all those and in the process, you know, got training from the head editor at Hal Leonard. So that is where my music engraving training comes from is this experience of producing a series of jazz and pop fake books um, for a major publisher. Now, I also uh, had music theory lessons as a kid, um, you know, as a uh, uh, when I took piano lessons as a child, my piano teacher was a composition professor, and she 
also taught us, like we'd have a weekly piano lesson, a private lesson, but then a, a theory lesson once a week. Musicianship, I, actually, I think is what it was called, um, a musicianship lesson. And, um, and I forgot that until this week. And I need to check in with her and find out if I, uh, if I'm misremembering, because, you know, we're Facebook friends. Um, Elizabeth Scheidel was her name, Elizabeth Austin now. Um, and she was a, you know, com a composition professor, up and coming uh, professional composer. And she taught like this theory uh, musicianship class once a week, in addition to the private piano lessons. And in there, you learned a lot of theory, a lot of how how to write music, compose music, and you learned a fair amount of the rules of music notation also, way more so than an ordinary piano student would learn. You know, I, I had the great fortune to have an actual composition professor as my teacher from a young age and got exposed to that kind of stuff. So I got exposed to that and then, you know, eventually went and got a master's degree in composition and studied. Um, there's not a music 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 notation but you know the college professors at a music school tend to be pretty pretty much sticklers for this kind of stuff and mine were and so yeah you learned a lot of these kinds of things so i have an academic background uh from the university and from my childhood studies um, i have that kind of academic background as well as this practical background of doing things for how leonard and then um a couple other academic aspects that are worth uh, knowing about. And one, and it, this isn't about me, but it's about what kinds of things you can learn, right? So all of this stuff, like, let me tell you one of the things that I learned as one of the things that I was a kid had to do with things like, uh, let me find a rhythm right here. This rhythm right here, this note, is written as an eighth note tied to another eighth note. You might look at that and say, well, wait a minute, an eighth note tied to an eighth note, isn't that the same as a quarter note? And it is the same as a quarter note, yes. But it's not correct to write a quarter note here because there are rules for how rhythms should be written in a way that makes it clear. And you've heard me talk about this before. The things that I'm talking about here aren't new, uh, necessarily, they're um, they're things that um, that I've talked about before, but kind of scattered about as they come up. Now we're gonna focus on this and really learn this stuff. So, like this, the rule here is that in four four time, which this is, the middle of the measure you should treat like a separate measure, essentially. In other words, you should be able to look at a four four measure as two two four measures i should be able to look at the first half of this measure and say hey here's two beats did my screen just flash my screen is flashing hmm that's unfortunate screen is flashing over on my other computer but uh i, mean, I don't know if it is for you too but it, it came back so i look at the first two beats and i can see this is two beats that's just like a two four measure and then i can look at this and say this is two beats. This is just like uh, a two four measure. So sound is also glitching. This is highly unfortunate. So let me take another step back here and talk a little bit about big picture stuff and hope that you can hear me. If not, they'll be recording. Um, but these live streams, I love doing these live streams. I love doing them. I think they're very valuable and getting the live chat is great. But as we've seen, there are issues, uh, whether I do it here, whether I did it on YouTube, there were always issues occasionally. And when I've done things on Zoom, we had to miss an entire, well, we didn't miss an entire office hour, but I had to do it on my phone because Zoom went down for the entire day. And I've had days when my internet is completely not working, right? So, and I had to do it from the park. I had to do the music masterclass from the park, right? So live streaming and live meetings, they're great except when they're not so one of the one of my goals in these new workshops is to not depend on live but give the same value as live so let me switch gears and talk about that let me know if if it's like absolutely unlistenable yeah i hear myself over here um but um so uh like 
I want to focus a little bit more on pre-recorded content, but timely pre-recorded content. So for instance, just like if you think about the jazz piano holiday course, I did pre-recorded videos that I posted every week. And then you all worked on something and then I gave feedback in the community. And then I also did feedback in the music masterclass. Well, I'm going to do the same sort of thing here, except we'll also use the music music or cafe for if I do, if I want to give feedback on people's work on music engraving, I'll give it during the cafe. So that'll become something that happens during the cafe, but I don't want to depend on that totally. So I'll also be um, uh, giving feedback within the community and posting videos. And this is like this really nice thing. I, when I'm doing these videos like this, I meander, I talk about lots of things. I'm responding to chat. I'm, I'm noticing technical issues, right? I'm dealing with all of those things, but I can give focused critique by video much better. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to like, if on Monday, I, I'm not saying that this is exactly what the schedule is, but as an example schedule on Monday, maybe I'll give a video where I give you some information and a project to work on. You work on that project over the week. And then on Friday, I record a video in which I pick half a dozen pieces or whatever to give more detailed feedback on. And then I post that video and then you watch that. And then we're not at the mercy of live streaming. And yet I'll still have the Music Core Cafe, still have the Music Masterclass where you can watch that. And if things work great, they work great. And if they don't, they don't. And, you know, I can keep looking for other alternatives and see if there's something that works perfectly. But mm, mm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that anything works perfectly when it comes to live streaming. That's become my, uh, my realization here in the world. So in any case, that's kind of the model that I'm looking at here. I give you some information. I give you a project to work on. You work on the project over the week. And then at the end of the week, I pick some of them to give more detailed critique on by video that I then post and you watch at your own time. You don't have to worry about like getting up at four in the morning as I know, uh, I don't know if Rod, uh, Rod is here, but I know he has to get up really early in, the, early in the morning to participate in these or stay up late for some people or just, you know, well, I'm working, I can't do this thing at this time or, you know, whatever. Um, so the live content is great. I'm going to keep doing it, but I'm not going to rely on it exclusively. It'll be, uh, you know, me doing, um, providing multiple avenues of, of, uh, of, of support, multiple avenues of instruction, multiple ways of taking advantage of the kinds of things that I can do. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at here. So um, one of the things that you might expect as a result of that is like the Music Core Cafe, if you think about it, week one is usually um, uh, an Ask Me Anything session. Yeah, that'll stay. Week three, I've been doing score of the month. Well, that'll probably be is staying that way, but it'll be maybe something focused specifically on uh, work that we're doing in the context of this music engraving workshop in which work that you all are doing, I'll focus and show the work and we'll and I'll do some of the critique, some of the feedback that I give that way. And of course, one of the things that's nice about this particular format here in in the community is I can bring people on as guests and assuming that everything else is working, that will work also, right? And because that didn't work so well on YouTube, work sometimes, not other times. So um, still be on the table as something to work on. So let me go back to talking about um, some specifics here. So when I mentioned that this was two beats and then the second half of the measure is two beats, that's why these ties are breaking that up. That's why these four eighth notes are not all beamed together because that split in the middle of the measure needs to be shown. Well, this is something that you need to do. Um, it's something that you need to know about. If you're writing music, you need to know these rules because MuseScore will happily let you type a quarter note there. Right? If I type a quarter note here, if I turn this into a quarter note, MuseScore will let me do that. It will let me enter that quarter note there. If I had nothing there and I just said five for quarter note, oh, let me uh, do my little demo thing. Give me a sec. Um, there we go. Um, if I type five for quarter note and then 
enter the note, enter the chord, D, G, and B flat. U square lets me do it, but that ain't right. So um, you need to kind of know something. Um, and yeah, whether you think of it as 2-2 two, two, or 4-4, four, four, the point is you, you need to think of the measure being split there. Um, yeah, you just need to think of it that way. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that more in, in the, the workshop. So MuseCore does have a command that can fix some of that stuff for you. If I select this measure and come to Tools, Regroup Rhythms, watch what happens to this quarter note here. Boom. It fixed it for me, right? So MuseCore knows how to fix. I'm just undoing that because I, I do that. Um, MuseCore knows how to fix things for you to some extent, but it doesn't know everything. It knows how to do some things. And then sometimes there can be reasons. In 3-4, the rules are a little different. In 3-4, um, the, general, the general thing is still you want to show the first two beats and then the second beat. The idea is that like th these rhythms are complicated. They have 16th notes. When 16th notes are present, the rule is show each beat because that way, Every rhythm is one of the only eight rhythms, and that's something I talk about a lot in like my music theory course, and we'll continue to talk about in this music engraving workshop, that at some level there's only eight rhythms that you can make in standard notation. This is one of them, ba-da-bum. -da -bum. The other is bump-bump, and one is bump, and one is bump-ba-da, and one is ba-da-bump, <laughs> right? And uh, one is ba-ba-ba-ba, one is ba-ba, and the other is ba-ba. And I think I got all eight right there. And if I missed one, I'm sorry. But there's basically only eight ways you can stuff a beat full of 16th notes. Either it's a quarter note, two eighths, uh, an eighth and two sixteenths, two sixteenths and an eighth, etc. So in when rhythms have 16th notes, you show each beat individually. And then each beat is guaranteed to be one of those eight magic rhythms. And that's why we do things like tie this 16th to that eighth note. Even though it's not the middle of the measure, we, and I could have notated that as a dotted eighth note, but that would have obscured the beat. And now I can see ba da bum and bump bum with a tie across it. So um, so the rules when sixteenths are present is to show each beat. The rules when sixteenths aren't present and eighths are, and if, if there's eighth notes but not sixteenth notes, we don't want to show more than two beats at a time because then those same eight patterns will apply to eighth notes. And this piece is full enough of 16th notes that I don't know that I can find a passage um, actually in the drum part, maybe looking for a place where I can show that I actually did that. But I, I don't I don't offhand see a good example in this piece. Um, but let me um, bring up another piece because, yeah, I do want to be talking about this kind of thing. Um, so I want to talk also and use this to um, morph into another discussion here. Um, one of the other reasons why I have any interest in this subject or expertise or anything has to do with MuseScore. The fact that I got involved with MuseScore around 2011 and started doing things with MuseScore and needed to learn about music notation because I'm working on a music notation program and I need, and as I'm developing the software, I need it to do the right things, you know, by default. And yes, we don't change your rhythm for you, but there's a lot of other things we have to do. Like, for instance, right here, there's a G and an A. So this is my piece reunion, which you've probably seen before. And if you haven't, this was the demo piece for MuseScore. When you first started MuseScore back in 2012 is when I wrote it, you, instead of seeing a blank screen like you see now or a blank piece of paper, you saw a reunion. And the idea was to, to give you a demonstration of what's possible with the program. And um, and to just sort of show off the program a little bit. And a lot of what's in it, uh, I had to do manually uh, because MuseScore wasn't sophisticated enough to do the things automatically. And then over the years, we've made it more sophisticated. It's so like, I think, um, I'm trying to look, see if there's an example of something that I actually fixed myself. This might be one of them. I'm not sure, to be honest. But look at what's happening here. We have two voices. The upper voice has a C and a D, and they're on opposite sides of the stem. And then the lower voice has a G and a D. They're on the same side of the stem, and they align with the C. 
well, this is proper notation. This is how to do multiple voices. Um, I'm not sure that a MuScore of one did that correctly. It might have aligned the G, it might have aligned the bottom voice with the D. I'm not sure. It did a lot of things wrong in cases like that. Um, so I see flickering again, and I apologize. Um, but um, uh, it did a lot of things like that wrong uh, as far as figuring out which notes need to align with which, which notes go on which side of the stem when you have clusters like this. A lot of things it just got wrong. Also having to do with the accidentals, like cases like this where there's a sharp and a natural sign in two different voices and which way they go, you know, like there's supposed to be this diagonal that runs from the, from the, that runs up and to the right or down and to the left. Um, that the, the rules for how the di the accidentals go. These were some of the very first things that I worked on when I started programming for MuseScore. Um, the first things that I did was actually writing this demo score, a couple of things like that. I wasn't doing any actual programming, but I do have a degree in computer science. So when I got back into um, programming and decided, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to help with MuseScore here and I'm going to work on some of these things. These were some of the things that I worked on was like the the order the rules for how the accidentals get stacked like this that was one of the very first things that i did um another one of the very first things that i did had to do with cases like this where you have two notes that are possibly close together that are tied by default the, t the tie was too short you couldn't even see it so i wrote code that would automatically make sure the tie had a certain minimum length that was actually the first bit of code that i wrote and then i also wrote and then the first really big piece of code that i wrote actually the first bit of code i wrote had to do with chord symbols and uh understanding those so that's getting back to the jazz thing but then as far as other features had to do with things like stacking of accidentals. And so MuseScore does a lot of these things correctly by default now because uh, people like me and not just me, but other people have worked on that. For MuseScore 4, there's some great people, a guy named uh, Michel uh, Spagnolo, I don't even I have no idea if I'm saying that name right, um, is, uh, is doing a lot of the work on uh, improving some defaults even further and I look forward to showing you uh, some of the work that he's done because it's really quite incredible. Um, but uh, MuseScore 4 is going to get some things right automatically that we don't get right in MuseScore 3. But like, so for instance, right now, um, this is one of the measures I still had to adjust manually. It has to do with the, uh, the fact that there's actually three voices here, the up stem voice, and then two low bottom down stem voices, because one of them is moving in quarter notes, but one of them has a half note. So there's three voices at once. And a question comes up, well, in this case, should these two voices, the half note voice and the down stem quarter note voice, should their stems align or should they be offset? And the answer is sometimes one, sometimes the other. When is which? Well, that's one of the things we'll be learning about and and dealing with and discussing because sometimes there's not one right answer to that stuff but this is the place where i had to make that adjustment manually so since we're talking about three four and the reason i brought this up had to do with eighth note patterns um uh there's not any eighth notes within that three four section but there are here so here you see i've got the eighth notes written all beamed separately not all separately but one note at a time that's acceptable but so is um beaming these things and i actually defined shortcuts but i don't remember what they are so i'll just come to the palette here beam properties i could take this guy here and force it to be beamed this way so i have a group of four and then a group of two and this is one of the standard ways that we beam things in 3-4 time. So we, we don't beam the whole measure together necessarily. We don't beam each beat separately. But we, we split it up so that two beats are beamed together. This gets back to what I was saying. In If you only have eighth notes and no sixteenth notes, then two beats allows everything to be one of those eight rhythms. It's either going to be eighth, 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 or eighth eighth quarter or quarter eighth eighth or dotted quarter eighth eighth quarter eighth there's eight there's eight patterns the same eight patterns over and over again whether we're talking about eighth notes and quarters or whether we're talking about sixteenths and eighths 
um, for that matter, if we're talking about quarter notes and half notes, it's the same eight patterns over and over again. So all these rules of music notation are designed to leverage that so that you don't have to read left to right. We are taught that you read rhythms left to right. Oh, this note lasts this long, and then this note comes in when that note stops. Like to read this rhythm, I would say, oh, this note is half a beat. This note comes in half a beat later. This note beat, this note comes in one full beat later, but that's not really how one reads rhythm if you want to be good about it. Um, so uh, if the way you the way you do it is by pattern recognition, you recognize this is a pattern. So the pattern here is a two beat pattern and it's one of those eight patterns. And so by writing it this way, you see that. Um, and it makes it that much easier to read. But this, yeah, and I see now your question is about ties, but it's the same thing. If this had been a tied note, the same issue applies. Yes, I'm going to tie it to show these two beats as a thing unto themselves. I want to show those two beats so I can recognize that pattern. Because if I write it with a quarter note like this, I don't recognize the pattern. Nothing in this measure right here fits the pattern. It's not any of those, there's no way to parse this with my brain to see any of those eight patterns. So it becomes a matter of dividing that note up with a tie like that. And let's see what happens, actually, what happens if I'm going to rechange that to a quarter note and see what MuseScore does with it with the uh, um, regroup rhythms. Yeah, see, MuseScore got that one wrong. It It's an algorithm doesn't understand everything. It doesn't understand 3-4 very well at all, um, but it also doesn't understand certain things about the beaming, the fact that I already uh, fiddled with the beaming. Um, so yeah, you need to know the rules. You can't depend on MuseScore to do things for you. So um, this would be wrong. Now, on the other hand, the following would be okay. This version here And I know it's flickering again, and that must mean my sound's cutting in and out, but um, I'm just going to keep going. Um, here, I see one beat, and then I see two beats together that form one of those eight patterns. So this becomes an acceptable way of doing it also. The first way of doing it, I showed the first two beats followed by the, the third beat. Um, this is showing the first beat as a group followed by the second two. So one is what we call a two plus one division of the measure. The other is a one plus two division. The two plus one division is, is the more common way to do it, the more standard way to do it, but there are situations in which this one plus two division can be perfectly okay. And that's also the kind of thing um, that we talk about. So yeah, what I would say is it's not that we always tie across the beat because this is acceptable. If we have a two beat grouping that we allow to be as such, like I do right here at the beginning, uh, right at the beginning of, of Reunion, I've got a two beat grouping. Two beat groupings are allowed to have notes that tie across the beat. That's one of our eight patterns. Ba -ba -ba. So uh, if you went all the way back to the beginning, then um, maybe refreshing your screen would fix that. Um, uh, so I'm going to put that in the chat, because if that happened for anyone else, if it jumps to the beginning, maybe refresh browser. But for me, it's still working. Um, so uh, did I hit enter on that? No, I didn't hit enter yet. Now I hit enter. Okay. Um, so... Uh, so yeah, there's certain places where you could do that. So as when you're dealing with eighth note rhythms like this, you know, not 16th notes, you want to be able to see things two beats at a time because that's what's going to allow you to have one of the eight magic rhythms. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of the fact that it really is about these eight magic rhythms. So um, this is one of them. Ba -ba -bum. It's just one of the eight possible ways to stuff two beats full of... Uh, it's one of the possible ways to fit... Uh, eighth notes and quarter notes into two beats. If there's only eight ways to do it, this is one of them. And so this is one of the times when it's okay to have a quarter note straddle a beat like that. Um, and so yeah, you'll, you'll want to know the rules for that kind of thing. And um, 
so the, yeah, there's all sorts of places here where MuseScore is doing things automatically. Here's another place where there's like a kind of a, uh, a cluster in the upper voice and a single note in the lower voice. Here's a case where there's not a cluster within a voice, but there's kind of a cluster between the voices, the D and the C collide, right? So there's rules for which note goes on which side and how things work. And to be honest, MuseScore 1 got a lot of that stuff wrong. And I took it on myself to fix as much of that as I could. I didn't do it perfectly, and it's you know continued to be improved on over the years. And as I said, MuseScore 4 is going to improve further. But my point here is that I learned a lot of the rules um, that I didn't necessarily learn because when you're working on like fake books for Hal Leonard, you don't you don't encounter these cases so much because you're dealing with one note melodies, you're not dealing with chords, and you're not dealing with multiple voices and things like that. So I'm not saying it never came up, but I didn't have to get as deep into that subject. But when I started working on MuseScore, I wanted to make sure we did the right thing. So I had to learn more about music notation, some of which I had learned as a child because of uh, my piano teacher, some of which I had learned in college, but a lot of these rules I learned because I worked on MuseScore. And so now it's time to show off another resource. Um, this is Behind Bars. And again, I don't need to show anything in any le level of detail that would require you to have to, uh, you know, require me to stop sharing my screen. But it's a great, great resource. Um, and I'm going to post the link. Uh, Behind Bars is the name of the thing. But more than that, if I jump over to the community, I'm going to post the link to where I gave my review of it and a link where you can buy it. And yes, disclaimer, it's one of those affiliate links where if you buy the book uh, through my link, I get a slight kickback on it. And so, you know, that's one of the things that kind of helps me out as I'm uh, no longer um, no longer employed at the university. Every little bit helps, right? So where did I put it? Under recommended resources. Uh, I'm just going to grab my little uh, thing about behind bars here, grab the link, and post it into the chat. There you go. So that's got my information about it so you can learn more about it and maybe help me out a little bit if you decide to buy the book. So uh, I mentioned this book because this is kind of considered the modern definitive standard on music notation. There's other books on music notation that have been written over the years, some of which are maybe less academic. They're more for like beginners just learning to read music. No, this is meant for professional music engravers or designers of music notation software. It's, it's at that kind of level, and that's why it's that thick. Um, and it's available both hardcover and Kindle. The Kindle version is obviously a lot cheaper. So that's a good way to go for a lot of people. So um, the uh, this book is the kind of the standard that a lot of people go to. And yeah, people might say, like the guy who's actually our engraving expert at MuseScore, I know Simon is not particularly a fan of everything in the book. So I don't want to say this is the end all be all, but there's nothing better. <laughs> there's nothing that's been written in the last 30 years that anyone would point to and say, yeah, that's the book to use instead. Um, it's just that, you know, everyone, it was written by a woman, Elaine Gould, who's the Elaine Gould, who is the uh, head of uh, the head editor at Faber Music in England. And, you know, she's coming at it from their particular perspective, but other publishers have their perspective, their own style, their own rules they follow. And so they might say, oh, no, Elaine's wrong about this. You should do you should this thing should go this way or whatever. And that's fine. Um, I'm not going to treat her as the Bible. Um, but there's only a, you know, there's a small number of books that are as authoritative as this out there. Most of them are 100 years old and sorely out of date. So um, I'm going to propose that we use this book uh, as a resource. And so I would love it if as many people as want to participate in this uh, music engraving workshop, go ahead and order a copy of that book. 
um, before next week. And if it comes before next week, great. If not, that's fine too. If you do Kindle, of course, it comes instantly. So um, I want to maybe do a book study on that, right? Where uh, every week a new chapter, or we focus on that chapter. That's not the only thing we'll do, but that's something. Because I, I do want us to, to get inside that. And then if there's areas where we think, oh, no, this is... We, we we don't agree with this or, you know, I'll maybe check in with Simon and si Simon, by the way, is uh, the, the person who works for MuseScore as our music engraving expert. And he's the one who like decides on some of these things now uh, as this guy, Michelle, I mentioned, who's doing all the work, the programming work on fixing some things. Uh, Simon is the one who's sort of guiding him and this is how it should work and so like some of the things that are going to be improved uh as an example let's look at hmm, i'm looking for a really good clear example let's compare these two measures actually let's just compare this measure and this measure this measure here has two eighth notes that are that far apart this measure here has two eighth notes that are that far apart they're both eighth notes they're both on the same staff. They're both on the same system. Why are they farther apart in this measure than in this measure? Why? Because our spacing algorithm in MuseScore 3 and all versions of MuseScore up until there is just not that good. It's, it does a lot of things pretty well, but it's not as sophisticated as it should be in terms of allocating the widths of the measures. So in this case, this measure is quite simply not wide enough. It should be made wider. Like a lot of things are done correctly within the measure, but this measure is just not wide enough. It should be made wider. And I'm going to use uh, the curly brace here to make it wider so that these eighth notes are now as wide as those. That's like a manual adjustment you really kind of have to do to get professional results in MuseScore 3. You have to know when are the are the measure widths not right and adjust it yourself. MuseScore 4 is going to get that kind of thing right by default. So that's going to be pretty awesome. Um, so anyhow, um, uh, behind bars will be something that we'll be studying. And, you, you know, you don't have to participate in that if you don't uh, feel like it or just participate in the discussions if you want. You don't have to have the book, but I definitely recommend it um, if you want to learn more about music notation. And, uh, you know, at some point, maybe we'll go back and get some of the older uh, older books and do some study on that, too. And I uh, certainly won't get in any go, won't get in anyone's way who wants to do that on their own as well. But I'm going to maybe focus a little bit on behind bars. Uh, and so that's one of the things we'll do as part of this. So um, uh, that's kind of my um, my spiel here. These are some of the things that I want to talk about. So I, again, the basic format is I'm going to give you some instruction at the beginning of the week, give you something to work on. And at the end of the week, uh, hopefully you've got something to show for it. I give some feedback and then we move on. And week to week we'll do that. Maybe some projects will be ongoing projects where we work on a big piece for a month. There's another thing I want to show you here. And this is another part of the puzzle. And again, nothing important about what I'm showing you that you need to uh, really uh, see up close. But what this is, this is uh, the open, well-tempered clavier. And so what this is, and I've referenced this before, I reference it a lot in my, in my uh, counterpoint course. Um, but at one point, in the uh, de early development of MuseScore, um, actually before MuseScore 1 even came out, there was a guy named Robert Goldberg who was interested in producing a uh, like public domain uh, edition of uh, Bach, of various different Bach works, starting with the Goldberg variations and then, then moving on to Well-Tempered Clavier. And Joanne, I don't know how much the Kindle edition costs, but if you click that link, that I just posted above and then click through it to where it says Kindle edition, you'll find out because I'm sure the price changes all the time and they offer specials and things like that. So I, I really don't know what the current cost is. It's just less than the hardcover. So um, uh, it's, um, but yeah, it's it's definitely well worth it if you want to really study this stuff because there, there's really nothing nearly as authoritative to even compare it to. Um, yeah, 40 sounds about like what I think I paid for it. 
Um, so this open well-tempered clavier was this project. It started with open Goldberg for the Goldberg variations, and then they moved on to well-tempered clavier, where they basically got a bunch of people to produce versions of these Bach uh, masterworks uh, in MuseScore, and along the way discovered, well, MuseScore doesn't handle this, and so we fic we implemented things in MuseScore to support it. Like one of the things was one of the Bach Goldberg variations has a movement where it's different time signatures in the different hands. Like one hand is in 4-4 four, four, and the other hand's in 12-8, except it's not that, but it might as well be. Um, where the two hands are in different time signatures, MuseScore didn't support that. So uh, Werner, the original developer of MuseScore, added support for that. It's, it's a little dicey, doesn't work as well as you'd want, but it's there and it was there specifically to support the Goldberg variations. And so uh, and other features also were added specifically to support this. So it was this collaborative kind of open source effort to produce kind of professionally edited because they, you know, they used someone who is kind of a professional editor to help with the actual engraving process and, you know, doing things like adjusting the positions of notes and so forth. Um, so uh, it's an addition then of the well-tempered clavier that was done in MuseScore 2. Well, it was done before MuseScore 2 was a thing. It was done like in a beta early, like a, it was done in a nightly build, basically, of MuseScore 2. Um, at least the Goldberg was. I actually forget if uh, well Tupper Clavier might have been redone when MuseScore 2 came out. But um, if I go to the open score. And then that eventually became the Open Score project, by the way. And then so now there's not just Bach, but all these other editions of Beethoven and so forth. And since these other editions are done more recently, let's let's take a look at one of those. Here's an edition of Moonlight Sonata. This was done in 2.3.2, still an older version of MuseScore, but more recently than MuseScore 1. So this was an edition of the Moonlight Sonata done and, you know, kind of professionally edited and designed to do all the kinds of things that we are talking about learning to do here, not just enter the notes, but get these details right. Here's a case like when I talked about um, in my uh, like spiel for what this course would be. Sometimes dynamics should go above the staff, sometimes you know, but normally they go below. When to move them above? Here's a place where someone moved a, a dynamic above. Why? Because, well, let me reset it below. Below it would have kind of been squeezed in between that bottom voice and the staff here. And there's nothing below it for to apply to anyhow. So it just seemed logical to that particular editor to put that dynamic above. Also, because this is introducing the melody. The melody comes in there, and it made sense because the, the this voice here, doo -doo -doo -doo, right? That's just the arpeggio. It, it didn't make as much sense to make it seem like the arpeggio suddenly gets quieter, and not to honor the fact that it's really about the melody coming in, and that the melody isn't coming in quieter. It's been uh, pianissimo the whole time. But to make it clear that just because the melody comes in, it doesn't come in loud. So there were specific reasons why the dynamic was placed above, having to do with all that kind of stuff. Well, the, these are the kinds of things that I that I talk about here. It, it, it's not just knowing how to flip the dynamic above. I pressed X. I pressed Control Z. No, I pressed Control R to reset it. Oops. I pressed Control R to reset it below, and then I pressed X to flip it above. So that's a matter of knowing how to use MuseScore. But again, what I want to teach here in the engraving workshop is why to do, when to do these different things that we already maybe know how to do. Maybe we know how to do them, maybe we don't. And, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll teach enough about how to use the program too. All right, that's my spiel. You've, you've seen a few different things. We talked some about uh, specifics of rhythmic grouping rules talked a little bit about that dynamic placement business. There's so much to talk about in music engraving. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to just get deep inside that. And I'd really love to have you all join. So uh, here's the uh, where we come to the end here. And I give you my commercial spiel. If you are not already a what I'm now calling gold level member, that's going to be your cue. So it was called um, 
nestormusequare.com p gold that's the link um so i was calling it all access member and i've renamed it gold member but it's the same thing if you're a gold level member sorry i'm not calling it gold member because austin powers um so gold level member um so uh this is the thing that was formerly called all access member i'm calling it gold because i'm not ruling out the possibility that it will become other levels in the future and other things possible it just made sense as long as introducing new things i i've been talking about branding a little bit this is part of the effort so but it's the same thing if you're already an all access member you're you're now a gold member a gold level member sorry um so uh this is what i would love people to join then you can participate in this uh, music engraving workshop as well as the musicianship workshop musicianship skills workshop that i'll be talking about tomorrow as well as all my other courses and my office hours and everything else it's really an amazing thing it's like it's it's a way better thing than i ever did for my students at regis and you get it for only 20 bucks a month instead of uh um the thousands a semester that they're paying to be college students right it's it's crazy how awesome uh this is so in any case end of my commercial part of the announcement hope everyone has a great day and I'll be back to tell you more about the musicianship skills aspect of things tomorrow and look at some actual music. So thanks, everyone. And uh, let me play out my theme song and use that as an opportunity. And, and I can watch my other screen here and find out. So, so that's the other thing that I learned, right, is... learned uh, is that I, I can't cut this thing off too soon because then it cuts me off in sentence so I'll let it run after I'm done but thanks everyone for being here and I definitely hope you all as many of you as, as uh, can swing it will join us for this it's going to be it's just going to be a great ongoing learning experience between this and the musicianship skills workshop and everything else that I offer I do not think you will regret participating in this so please give it a shot you know what is it you know what's it really gonna hurt at the price of lunch or something like that once a month to, to, to try it so there's you know I, I gotta I gotta be the commercial guy because that's that's what I do also right but um so tomorrow I'll be talking about um uh, the musicianship skills thing next week will be the uh, third week of the month so I will be talking about um, the score of the month, and so we'll be featuring some of the stuff that we'll be doing in the Music Engraving, engraving Workshop. We'll be featuring that right away, and you'll get another taste of what this is all about. So thanks again for uh, joining, and I hope to see you soon. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>